Thank you for joining us for Everything Under the Sun, the AccuWeather podcast. I'm your host, meteorologist Regina Miller, and I'm joined in the studio now by my producer, Andy Robb. Hi, Andy. Hi, Regina. How are you? Good. I'm doing good. What's going on today with our podcast, Andy? Well, hurricane season right around the corner, and we are going to be joined by AccuWeather's very own Marshall Moss and John Porter to discuss AccuWeather's new real impact scale. Right. And you know what? We really, when you think about it, this is something that was very much needed because the Saffir Simpson scale has been used since the 1960s. And it was later kind of adjusted a little bit in the early 70s. But that's how long we've been using the Saffir Simpson scale. So when you think about storms like Hurricane Sandy, that was a category one, and then the devastation it did, clearly that scale didn't indicate to people how bad things really could be. So AccuWeather has this new scale, and we're going to be talking about that coming up. Stay with us. Well, I'm in the studio now with John Porter. He's our Vice President of Business Services and Marshall Moss, AccuWeather's VP of Forecasting. And and you have your own title, too, that we'll get to in just a minute that you told me I didn't know about, uh, Marshall. (laughs) But we're talking about a new method of classifying hurricanes, and it's the AccuWeather Real Impact Scale. So thank you both for joining me. I appreciate it. Good to be with you again, Regina. Happy to be here. Yeah, what's your title? Uh, there was a title I never even heard about. The Prescient Overlord of Weather. Yeah. It was designated on me in a newspaper article in San Diego last year uh, Pre- about a rainfall forecast that we hit from over a month out. Prescient? Prescient, Prescient Overlord of Weather. Wow. Okay, well, we're going We're going to have that made on T-shirts. Yeah, and we'll that's all definitely around, T-shirt so. material. Right. He'd be pleased, I think. <laughs> no, yes. I think so, too. I think he's already started to print them up, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, but thank you both for joining me. And I, I want to talk about this new AccuWeather Real Impact scale because for the longest time the Saffir Simpson scale is everything that we've been using in you know the weather society the weather world talk to me about how long AccuWeather has been considering the need for a new scale well we've been uh, looking at this for a couple of years Regina and it really comes out of a sense of uh, frustration I think that the entire weather community has had in terms of how do we best convey all of the risks that are associated with a landfalling hurricane so that people understand beyond just wind, what kind of factors are going to be in play that may uh, not only affect their safety, but also create damage. So this is something that we've been working on for a couple of years. And I would say that it was elevated in its, uh, in its in priority for us based on um, both Hurricane Harvey in, um, in 2017 and then also Hurricane Florence last year in 2018, both major storms that had a tremendous impact from um, excessive rainfall. Um, And really, we recognized the response from people in those situations uh, we think could have been a lot better if there was a more complete understanding of all the different impacts uh, that were going to be felt by that particular storm. Okay. And some of this could even date back, if you think back, as far as Hurricane Sandy, where mm. there was the whole debate about tropical versus not tropical and the lack of hurricane warnings. And, and there was never really a, a perfect way of communicating what the anticipated impacts were going to be from that storm. And you look back, I mean, Sandy on the real impact scale would be a Category 5 storm. But when it was coming inland, again, there was a lack of hurricane warnings, lack of tropical storm warnings. There were high wind and coastal flood warnings, which are common in those areas. They come out a handful of times per year and don't tend to get a whole lot of attention. So really, you know, as a community, there's been discussion for many years about how do we better convey the impacts of the weather? And it really came down to somebody has to step forward and do it. And that's where AccuWeather stepped in and said, we're going to develop a way to better communicate the overall impact of the storm. Right. It'd be so because the, the sense of urgency, uh, unfortunately, on a Category 1 storm may not be there when you're only looking, really focusing on winds, but the after effects of what a storm can do. And that's what you saw with Florence. So Florence was downgraded to a one before landfall, which was well forecasted because we knew it was going to slow down off the coast and that would lead to upwelling and and changes in the storm structure. But we also knew there was going to be 30, 40 plus inches of rain in some parts of North Carolina. And how do you convey that? Again, we can communicate that there's going to be 30 to 40 inches of rain, but nobody knows what that means. Nobody knows what that looks like, what that experience is going to be. Right. So they're they're I see really this focused on the category. Right. Oh, I it's a Category 1 storm. Something... I'm going to let my guard down. Right. And then, boom, all this catastrophic flooding occurs. We wanted a way to better communicate that, to help people make better decisions for their lives 
around what the impacts of the storms are going to be so that they can protect their families, their businesses, their assets. And and that really is the key point there is really giving people a complete understanding of all the potential risks. And just like you said, Regina, we were obviously heavily involved in expressing all of those impacts. Um, and we got a lot of great feedback from users uh, that they appreciated the understanding of, of the tremendous impact that flooding rain was going to have from both Harvey and Florence um, in the areas that were heavily impacted. That was something that we were stressing in all of our uh, broadcasts and all of our forecasts. But it was interesting. I was doing uh, some uh, TV broadcasts before Florence's landfall and just listening to some of the programs uh, uh, prior to me uh, coming on and, and people in those areas in North Carolina were being interviewed and some of the comments were, around the fact this is just a category one storm we've seen it before not going to be a major thing that's that i'm going to prepare for and so that's again where we see the ability to uh, highlight the tremendous risk that's associated with some of these other components storm surge flooding rainfall both at the coast and also inland and uh, and total economic loss and economic impact from the storms that really will help move the needle in terms of communicating to people in addition to the information about the Saffir Simpson scale but showing to uh, to our users and to others who have adopted this platform that that there's a lot of risks that on average uh, create more risk to to lives than just simply the wind. And so we're working to innovate how people perceive the risk from hurricanes so that they can are in a better position to make the right decisions for themselves, for their families, and for their businesses. So I remember uh, doing uh, Hurricane Florence. I was on the air at the AccuWeather Network. Yes. I remember that we kept stressing the fact this is a Category 1 don't let this fool you. There is going to be, you know, trying to really convey a message where you're like, okay, that's what this, the category is, but here's what you're going to end up with and trying to keep conveying that message. So ideally, these two scales are kind of work in tandem. They do. But I mean, you keep in mind people are getting their messages in different places in some cases also. Mm -hmm. So it's really a way of, again, not everybody expresses it the same way or communicates it the same way. Um, in some cases, if you're just seeing a graphic and seeing a category one storm, you don't know what else is coming. You don't know what else to expect. It's making sure that we're do putting together information and communications in a way that are effective on any medium in any way you're seeing it. And yes, this is added to the Saffir Simpson scale. The Saffir Simpson scale is actually part of the real impact scale. Um, but it's also adding in the fact that you could have catastrophic damage from rainfall, mm -hmm. from storm surge, right. economic impacts from the storm. You know, I mean, there's even damaging impacts coming upstream of the storm. And you think of some of the ones like Michael that came up and brought tornadoes up through Virginia that killed people. Right. You know, there's so many different facets to a storm to consider. The Saffir Simpson scale just focuses on the wind. And that makes sense what you're saying, Marshall, because when I think about it, like so much of our information now is consumed with maybe one graphic that shows up on Twitter <laughs> right. or one mm -hmm. graphic that shows up on Facebook or wherever it may be. So if it was just the Saffir Simpson scale on Florence, for example, and you see category one and that's the only information you consumed you would really be at a loss on how to be prepared for that. Right. And that's and that's partly because um, one of the ways we know from from our experiences that people are going to make decisions about how they react to storms based upon their perception of the risk level as well as their experience with previous storms. And so that's why when in some areas they see a Cat 1 hurricane uh, based solely on the wind, they may make a certain set of decisions based on assumptions that they've seen those conditions before. In the case of Florence and, and many other storms over the years, we know as meteorologists, every storm is different. Every storm's impact characteristics are very different. And so this is a way now for us to express more of the risks, a more complete picture for, uh, for people to be able to make the very best decisions um, as it relates to hurricanes. Because as Marshall was mentioning, there's so many different impacts and th and that are well beyond just simply the wind. Right. Now, let's, let's get specific about the scale. Can you guys explain to me what this new scale looks like? Categories. So the categories will range from less than one to the similar numbers to the Saffir Simpson scale, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. The reason we went with a less than one area is because we don't want to say zero if there's going to be some impacts, but they're expected to be minor. Okay. Because even minor impacts, and I'm putting minor in air quotes, could still have some significant impact okay. on people's lives, on, on property, or, or what may be. Um but then you move up into the one, two, three, four, five, and you know the minimum a storm will be is the number on the Saffir Simpson scale. So it starts with that. 
But then it's looking at the other impacts of the storm, whether it be, again, the storm surge, whether it be the rainfall, whether it be economic impact anticipated from the storm. And we're raising the categories based on those levels, um, based on proprietary algorithms and inputs to determine where the storm should fall historically. And we've gone back and rated every storm back to and before 2000. So there's some uh, level of statistics in it. Yes. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, okay. To make sure that we're coming up with the right numbers and the right forecast. So the one thing that I noticed, I have the scale in front of me here, is that you have the wind, it's categorized as the Saffir Simpson scale, but then you kind of break it down into how that impact is going to be, correct? So like a category one. Talk to me about a category one. Well, there's uh, various components, obviously, um, that uh, that go into uh, the characterization of a particular storm on the scale. But we are looking at, uh, at at wind impacts, at rain impacts, both at the coast and obviously inland, where there's just uh, there tends to be a tremendous risk in many cases from uh, from inland flooding as it relates to hurricanes in the United States and elsewhere around the world. Um, as well as coastal inundation. So we're talking about storm surge. And then also more broadly, the total economic impact from a hurricane as well. Uh, those are, are some of the factors that, uh, some of the many factors um, that go into the scale. And it's also been designed in a very flexible way so that as new science and, and new technology is innovated, we have the ability to uh, to easily integrate those components into the scale as well. So it's going to be, as you can see, a much more comprehensive way to describe the impacts of a hurricane um, than just simply looking at the wind. When you think about the winds in a hurricane, let's say you have a hurricane that has 100 mile an hour sustained winds. Mm-hmm. Generally, those winds are only seen over the water and the immediate coastline. They don't generally translate inland very well. This is only this scale is for land impacts. Okay. So it is only measuring the impacts over land for the storm of what's expected based on these categories. Where people are at, which is a key... Right key component, again, going back to being able to describe and innovate on the way in which people perceive their, their risks from any individual storm and help them make the very best decisions as to whether they need to evacuate, where they might want to evacuate to, how they're going to respond to a weather situation. It goes back to having a plan and being able to activate that plan and understanding what your risk level is. It's always very important, no matter where you live along the coast or inland in places that are threatened routinely by hurricanes, that you have before the season starts an understanding of, here here are my risks, here's the kind of information that I'm going to need to make decisions, uh, and here's my plan in general, because you don't want to be coming up with those kind of things when you have maybe some cases days or hours to react um, with a landfalling hurricane. And I saw you have an economic element of this economic loss. So you talked about kind of being fluid or the ability to change, because obviously numbers like that will change as, as you know, growth changes. Yeah, that's right. And, that, so. and, and we'd be looking there in, 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 uh, in that particular category at uh, what's the impact going to be in terms of what kind of damage might occur um, to, to homes and to businesses. What might the impact be to commerce? What type of insurance losses may occur. Those are just some of the factors that will go into that particular component. And it's not just where the storm is, but there's downstream economic impacts that are factored in as well. For example, um, a hurricane coming in along the Gulf Coast affecting the oil rigs, or more importantly, the refineries, are going to have a long, long-term, long wide, expansive um, impact on the price of gas, for example. That's an economic impact. Right, right. So it's factoring in what are all of the impacts from the storm. And I know often you'll have a storm that comes in is a hurricane in the Gulf, and then it impacts maybe like, you know, uh, coming up the Ohio Valley, and then it's slow moving, and then you end up with flooding. You right, can have exactly. have a long period of time where there's a lot of areas. And, and this is another area in the way of communications that AccuWeather, again, has a history of being very inventive. You know, we don't use the word remnants for a storm from that situation, for example. Uh, we'll use tropical rainstorm. Because you have these storms coming in. They're not hurricanes anymore. They're coming in through the Ohio Valley, as you said, and causing flooding. And in some cases, they could kill somebody. And frankly, you know, who wants to be, have somebody killed by remnants? Right, because it, again, does it's, not convey the significance exactly. of that, the event. That's, that's right. We have to be, we're not only experts in meteorology, but we have decades and decades of experience in terms of how do we communicate right that weather insight and those actionable weather forecasts because we could have the best forecast but if people don't understand how to use that to make better decisions 
then um, then it's not living up to the full potential of that particular forecast. So that's why the innovation in terms of we've been innovators in terms of how we communicate about the weather for decades. This is another one of those innovations, which we think will have a really ma- a major effect on uh, on the ability for people to make better decisions. Well, it's really important, the idea of getting the communication out there. I appreciate you both uh, for sitting down and talking to me today. And I know that as hurricane season you know, approaches, there will be much more information available. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Join us back here next week. We'll continue our discussion on hurricanes with our Hurricane Roundtable. But before we wrap up for today, we'll stay on the subject of hurricanes. Here are some things that you could do for hurricane preparedness with AccuWeather Ready. Be prepared for a tropical storm or hurricane before it's too late. If you live in an area that is prone to tropical storms and hurricanes, you may find yourself sheltering in place. It is wise to set aside space in your home or garage far in advance for supplies specifically in the event of a future storm or other natural disaster. These items can fall into six basic categories. Soft goods like blankets and pillows, changes of clothes and paper towels, toilet paper. There's health items such as first aid kits, medicines, prescriptions and dust masks. Then survival items. This includes things like two-way radios, weather radio, extra batteries, flashlights, a generator and fully charged cell phones and battery packs. You'll also want a lighter, matches, fire extinguisher, and fuel cans and fuel. Consider keeping your vehicles fully fueled as often as possible during storm seasons. Food and cooking items will be needed. You'll want to include canned and dry food, cooking and eating utensils, a manual can opener, filled propane tanks, and a camp stove or grill. If you have small children or pets, be sure to include things like baby food and diapers or extra pet food. Water can be stored closer to the storm. Legal items should be considered, duplicate driver's licenses, insurance documents, cash and credit cards. These can be stored in a Ziploc bag. And of course, lastly, tools. This might include tie-down ropes, plastic tarps, a ladder, plastic storage containers, tools like pliers and wrenches, and extension cords. You never know when a disaster may strike, but being prepared is always a good thing. For more safety and preparedness tips, go to AccuWeather.com slash ready. For AccuWeather, I'm Holly Holdren. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to AccuWeather's Everything Under the Sun, giving you the stories behind the weather and so much more. New episodes every Thursday. Just search for AccuWeather on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or visit AccuWeather.com slash podcast.